Okay, just so everyone knows, that's Andy on the end, Stephen in the middle, Christopher on closest to me. So before we get started with the questions, uh, you all could do a lot of things with your time and energy and to write a book and to research a book and to put all the energy that goes into doing it, you must have felt that there was some reason this needed to be written, that this just wasn't, you know, you, didn't, you don't write these books because you were, had nothing to do. You actually felt there was some reason that you knew something that the general public was not acknowledging. So can you just each quickly just explain why you would take so much time, so much effort to write a book on, on one of these topics um, you must have thought there was a reason that this needed to be addressed that was important enough to devote your life when the mainstream doesn't seem to be talking as much about it. So wh what was the reason you wrote this book and is being so passionate about these subjects? Uh, I don't come from a journalistic background. I come, I'm a, a college professor, so I see students every day. That's who I interact with. And um, on those rare occasions when I write a paper, I write a paper that gets published in a scientific journal and then about a handful of people I know read it. And <clears throat> I found it interesting that um, scientists are, are dedicated people. They're really dedicated people. They really care about what they're doing and they think it makes a difference, um, but they rarely get or take the opportunity to, to write for different audiences. They are, we have to write for a specific audience because that's how we get tenure. That's how we get our credit for doing this work. We have to write for our peers. Um, and our peers are our friends and we know them, we talk, but uh, I don't think anybody else ever reads those papers. And then I talk to my students and that's good because my students go out and become teachers and, and, and maybe scientists and things like that. But it occurred to me that what I really needed to be doing, and I've emphasized this throughout my career, that we have to write, whenever we write one paper, we have to write two. We have to write one for our peers, and that's the one we get credit for, and then we have to write one for everybody else. And I really think that's important, and that all scientists should do that. The public is interested, too. The public wants to hear about the latest breakthroughs. They want to know what's up, and they want to be current except that gets filtered through the press, if it gets filtered through the press at all. It's very difficult for the public to go out and get readable versions of scientific papers. And so I think these kinds of books, and this goes for the books that, that, that come from a journalistic background or any other background, it's important that we write these books because who knows it better than those that are doing the research on it. So I've made every attempt to write <coughs> in a about science, but in a non-technical way, so that it doesn't come across as being too sciencey, I guess. But it's accessible. That's what I'm attempting to do. I th I bounce everything off my students. Um, if they don't get it, then I better not write it that way. So I do have some feedback that way on on what I write. But my intent is to try to make science accessible, and I think it's very important that if if I have a different way of seeing it, I come from more of the ecology and evolutionary biology background, and I think that understanding those principles will help others understand the topics better, then maybe that's the best way for me to approach it because I can, I can use the language, but use the language in a way that, that everybody can understand. So that's what I'm attempting to do, um, and I hope if you read my book you feel the same way, but um, what I've heard so far is I did all right. I've been an environmental journalist for uh, <laughs> 25 years, and so I've been writing a lot about flooding and droughts and you know, various kind of water disasters. And then at a conference, I ran into a scientist who said, you know, what's really interesting isn't the, the water that we drink or the water we use um, to wash. It's the amount of water it takes to make stuff. And so we had a conversation, 
And I was flabbergasted to finally realize everything we have is based on water. It takes water to make our clothes. It takes water to make electricity. It takes water to make our books. It takes water to make microphones. It takes water to do anything. So it, it sort of hit me in a big rush. You know, our society actually is based on water. It's not based on oil, like all the headlines say. It's based on water. And without water, which we don't pay that much attention to, unless there's a problem, we don't have anything. So that's how that, my book, Your Water Footprint, uh, came into being. There's a couple other stories involving Australian Aborigines, which I'll tell people tomorrow morning. Yeah. Um, is this on? Yes. OK, good. <laughs> uh, I wrote my book. I'm a journalist as well, and past roughly 25 years um, covering uh, environment issues, labor issues, social policy, social justice, um, and increasingly corporations, corporate power. And I wrote my book partially because I felt like I needed to make sense out of all the madness I was seeing um, when I was covering all these individual stories. And you know, you know, you don't get enough space, even in a magazine article, to really get to the bottom of something. And it's not just about article space, it's about time to accrue the amount of knowledge and evidence and also to develop the analysis, I think, about the entire food system, or in any of our cases, the whole system that we're looking at, um, takes an, an immense amount of uh, research and also time. And so I think it's critical, you know, as a journalist, I've increasingly gone toward uh, trying to analyze reality and not just report it, uh, and try to get to the bottom of, you know, well, why is this happening? And so. Part of my book, there's a section that goes into the whole history of uh, U.S. agriculture and farming, uh, sort of snapshot anyway of that history uh, from early sort of post-revolutionary war period on, and our whole increasing mechanization, industrialization, which we can talk about more later perhaps, and all the ramifications of adopting that system and spreading that system. So. I would just say that you know it was about putting all the pieces together uh, as best I could and analyzing a larger set of realities and looking at the whole system. So. Okay, so I'm going to ask a number of questions. Um, anyone can answer them, and maybe we'll try to keep them to like answers to like three minutes a piece, so I could get through a whole bunch of them if possible. So the first question is, how does animal agriculture the raising of animals to be eaten, that means beef, chicken, means cows, chickens, turkeys, pigs, um, milk from cows, eggs. How does the, the, all this animal agriculture affect our water supply? Uh, well, uh, agriculture is the biggest user of water. Um, in the U.S., it's by far the biggest, although energy is a other, another big user of water. Um, meat production, to get a calorie out of meat, takes 10 times as much water as it does for a vegetable a calorie. So if you look at uh, anything, if they think that this piece of meat or uh, animal product take, takes 10 times as much, as much water as a vegetable product, um, why is that? The reason is all of those animals had to eat vegetables in the first place and they have to eat a lot and they're not efficient in converting those calories from the crops, the grains, into meat calories. So it's way more efficient from a water perspective um, to eat uh, vegetarian. And that's a gigantically effective way to reduce the amount of water all of us are consuming every day because the number is actually quite large. It's uh, over 2,000 gallons each of us consumes every day. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you covered that really well. I'll just add, um, especially with animal agriculture, I mean, you're talking about um, also a very concentrated system of impact on a local or regional water supply. So not only is it using phenomenal amounts of water, 
in the aggregate, but in the local context or regional context, uh, it can be chewing up the entire water supply. So in California, where we've had um, epic drought <laughs> going on for rough, you know, most of the past decade with a few interruptions, um, you know, a lot of attention got paid on, uh, you know, went to uh, almonds as the, the big culprit. And, and they are a problem in, the, in, in terms of the nut family. <laughs> but, um, you know, clearly beef and dairy uh, and other animal products are the largest consumers of water, users of water. The other uh, piece of that puzzle is the processing of all of this food product takes immense amounts of water as well. So not only do you get, do you get it, you know, huge water waste in the raising of these animals and these huge concentrated uh, feeding operations, you know, you, again, they can also decimate the area's um, water table and lead to depletion of aquifers. Uh, so there are huge effects like that, to say nothing of all the water pollution as well, which perhaps we can get into later. But I think, I think it's worth... I think it's worth commenting also that um, the, the manner in which we feed animals um, is al also contributes to the use of water. Uh, if we're feeding, if we're growing 100 million acres of corn, 95% of which is not edible for humans, um, but about half of that is going into either the fuel industry so that it can go into our cars or it's going toward livestock feeding. We're now using immense amounts of water in completely different parts of the country. We're using water from other states um, to grow crops that are then shipped to areas where the animals are being fed that food. Um, and it is not even the food that those animals normally would eat. Um, so if you think about uh, cows being a sort of a evolved around eating grass, but we're now feeding them corn, but we're having to grow the corn, and we have to grow the corn in other areas where corn is grown because the climate's appropriate for corn. Um, and we need all the resources there, soil, pesticides, water, herbicides, you name it. Um, it's it's the, the impacts of this kind of food production goes way beyond just the use of water. It goes, it, it reaches into a, a large number of aspects of our, of our culture and it dominates the, um, the agricultural industry. Maybe one short thing. I would also add, just add that water pollution factors into uh, the water supply. So the use of water, of course, we've all been talking about, but it's also relevant to think in all the ways that the animal agriculture sector pollutes our waterways and the groundwater systems, which then depletes our actual water supply. Just to follow up on uh, that point, some of the worst uh, uh, waterborne illness cases have come from animal agriculture uh, that have, uh, well, around the world, hundreds of people die on a regular basis from that kind of pollution. Um, do we need chemicals on our crops, or can we grow as effectively with organic farming? Well, I, I can start this anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we definitely do not need chemicals on our food supply and our on our uh, produce. And um, of course, it was done for centuries without any chemicals. We already know that. So that if that's the best proof that you could possibly want, um, you know it. We also don't need chemicals to feed a starving world uh, because as study after study shows, we have more than enough food to feed the planet right now on a cal caloric basis, a protein basis. Um, you know, the issue is distribution and access to all different kinds of factors, land, market, credit, water, <laughs> um, all those pieces. So we absolutely do not. Um, study after study has also shown that uh, organic production can be done quite effectively and efficiently on a per acre basis. It can be at least as productive, not more productive than, uh, I will not call it conventional, I will call it non-organic <laughs> industrial agriculture. Uh, Agroecology as well, uh, which goes beyond organic to include various uh, very time-tested methods of uh, treatment of soil, organic treatment of soil, but also uh, diversified crop rotations uh, is another, another area where like people do intercropping and other things that produce incredible amounts of food on small uh, plots of land. So it's more than possible. 
do we need chemicals? I think when you ask that question, my, my immediate response is, um, why don't we step back just one step and take a look at why do we, are we in the situation where we're asking that question? Um, as Chris just alluded to, when you have intercropping systems and polyculture uh, systems, <coughs> uh, mixed crops, uh, small crops and rotational crop systems, one of the things that's included in those systems is the rest, not the, all of the biodiversity, but a great deal of other biodiversity is also present. And a lot of that biodiversity includes beneficial insects and beneficial organisms. And they tend to have a top-down effect on pest problems. That is, they are the controllers of the pest problems. And so when we take a look at a situation where we feel the need to apply chemicals, apparently we're in a situation where something has been lost from that system that has allowed one of the elements of the system to get out of control. Typically, it's a predator is missing. And so it, I think it's worthwhile to step back and say, if you're asking that question, there are some other questions you also need to ask in that situation. And that is, what have you done with the, the other organisms that were part of the system that were helping you up to this point? Something must have happened. Now, aside from that, <coughs> If you do find yourself in that, in that situation where you're considering using a technological tool to deal with a biological problem, you also have to acknowledge the fact that this has to be a temporary remedy because technological tools don't last very long, they always fail because biological systems will always overcome them. And so at best, if you're going to use chemicals, you have to have it in your mind that this has to be a temporary solution because if you start relying on technological tools as your answer to these problems, you get on that treadmill and you can't get off because you start doing increasing amounts of damage to the environment and then it gets to the point where it cannot respond when you need it to respond and it can't recover easily when you want it to recover. It's often said that, uh, you know, uh, only the people in the rich countries can afford organic. Um, but in fact, of course, people in the developing world uh, until very recently, were growing most of their food organically as well. I interviewed a, a woman who was a small farmer, you know, the size of an average backyard here kind of farm, and she had 30 different varieties in her little pot, plot of land, enough to feed her and her family, and sometimes sell to others. Her plot of land, which was part of a, a study done, um, was more productive in terms of the total volume of food that she produced. It was also more resilient when it was too dry and too hot, where other farmers were in trouble. She was doing fine. One of her crops, you know, she had different types. You know, she says, this one likes the, hot, the heat. This one, you know, likes it when it's cooler. So I plant both, just in case. So that type of agriculture is a lot more resilient to uh, conditions that change, as we are seeing more and more often with climate change. The technological uh, solution we've taken, which is a uh, sort of a simplistic approach with monocultures, is much more vulnerable to these changes. So the difference really is organic is a knowledge intensive form of farming. You have to know more about your land, you have to know more about the ecology, you have to understand plants and insects. And that's something we've lost and we need to get it back. And we have to support those who are struggling because it's often very difficult to learn this information. Many universities don't even teach organic agriculture. So, thanks. Do we have time for a quick addition? Um, okay, or go ahead. Um, why is the United States experiencing pest resistance problems that are unparalleled in magnitude anywhere else in the world? Why? Hold it close to you. <laughs> Hold it close to you now. Why? Um, the last estimate I saw was on the um, number of the dollar figure for chemicals sold around the world. Uh, agricultural chemicals, $40 billion, of which I think $23 billion is spent in the United States. We represent 4.5% of the world's population. We use, what is that, 60% of the world's chemicals. 
to grow our crops, and yet we're the most advanced country in the world, aren't we? Um, so either we're doing it completely wrong, or we're doing it right, and we're not, um, we're not advertising that very well, <coughs> I think. Um, we have taken, and, and I'm sure there's going to be some support for this statement, we have taken the path toward food production of intensification, uh, and we have not looked back in the last 70 years or so. We are going to try to increase production, uh, take over control of food production from nature, and turn it into a system, a process, uh, in which we manage all of the variables, right? Um, <coughs> and if in so doing it requires untold amounts of fertilizers and, and pesticides to do that, then that may just be the cost of doing business. Unfortunately, it's absolutely a dead end. Uh, it's unsustainable. It's doing incredible damage to our environment. It's even damaging the actual, the basis for food production itself, which is soil. Uh, to the point where soil is often not really alive anymore. And then that process has forced us into the greenhouse and into hydroponics and into as many other ways as we can think of to grow a plant without relying on nature. And so why we are so dependent on chemicals um, in this country and for our agricultural system is because we have taken a headlong dash into the world of technological marvelousness, and we are going to do it that way, um, with more or less complete regard for all traditional systems and for the evolutionary biology of plants themselves, and for um, any sort of recognition of how ecosystems actually work to produce biomass in this world. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to turn it over to <laughs> either of the other two who want to comment on that, but uh, we have put ourselves in this situation, and I think it's up to us to get ourselves out of this situation. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think that you can't really separate the issues of pesticides and other chemicals used in our food supply from for instance, USDA agriculture system policy, which for decades and decades now has both subsidized uh, this kind of consolidated farming, uh, I would say not only intensive agriculture, but extensive agriculture, if you think of it in a horizontal sense of just land ownership and scale of farm production. You know, the other thing is we subsidize, you know, some very water intensive crops, so, you know, corn and soy, not as bad as beef, but it's, you know, the corn and soy is used for beef. So it's like, you can almost get a double whammy there with that set of subsidies. Um, you know, there's been a policy for decades going back uh, to the early post-war, post-Second World War period of calling it fence row to fence row planting and get bigger, get back, get out was uh, Richard Nixon's Ag Secretary's mantra, was just get bigger, get out. And so, you know, these, these things go part and parcel together. Um, certainly the pesticide and petrochemical industry is a powerful force in American politics uh, in terms of protecting their interests. They are allied with other powerful forces, including you know, the fossil fuel industries and other agribusiness industries. The Farm Bureau is going like, to be there every time the petrochemical you know, companies are there to back them up on this. And, you know, and all the way down the line, I mean, the ag extension programs and USDA, uh, the, school, you know, the uh, ag education programs are so heavily sponsored by uh, industrial agriculture interests and push, you know, that push this petrochemical monocrop large scale get bigger get out model. So. Yeah, it's called uh, industrial agriculture for a reason because the whole mindset is uh, machines. We are putting green machines into this green dirt, or uh, machine dirt that holds up the plant and then we just put machine parts to make it do whatever we want it to do. So that sort of machine mentality is kind of where we've come from and where what's getting us into trouble. And that, of course, doesn't apply to living things. You can't treat uh, living things as machines. It's just like if you treated your partner as a machine, it wouldn't be a very long relationship. 
<laughs> so, uh, Andrew, in your book, Chasing the Red Queen, you are making the argument that uh, since World War II, we've been applying these industrial chemicals and that the plants or the bugs or the things we're trying to kill have been adapting. So it's 2018. Where are we in the race? Are the chemicals still ahead of the bugs? Are the bugs about to catch up? And like, you know, because it's still, it's still plenty of food when I go to the supermarket, so it seems like we're still getting food. Where is the race right now, and where do you see us in 5, 10, 15 years? Um, we are falling behind in the race. I don't think there's any question about that. The, the race I refer to is this race, the, the Red Queen race with Alice runs with the Red Queen, and they run as fast as they can, and they don't actually get anywhere. And this analogy has been used in evolutionary biology to represent two organisms that are competing with each other, or one is attempting to eat the other one, and as each one adapts to the presence of the other, the other adapts in return to the presence of the first. And this back and forth adaptation process is never ending, never ending. The problem is that if you stop racing, you lose and the other wins. So it's a race that has to be run, but it's a race that there is no finish line for. <clears throat> when we started using pesticides in the late 1940s, it was only a few years and the first word was DDT, the first terrestrial pesticide that we really started applying. Uh, on a large scale. It was, it was clear within just a few years that insect resistance was on the rise very quickly. Um, and after seven, eight years, uh, DDT was largely ineffective in many areas where it had been widely applied. And our response to that should have been, that was probably not a good idea. We need to go back to some other system. But our, 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 what we did instead was we thought we'll just make better chemicals because that one clearly wasn't good enough, which is a tough thing to say about DDT. That's about as good as it gets when it comes to killing uh, insects. So they don't come a lot better than that. And we thought we'll just make better ones or, or chemicals that can hit them harder, you know. The, the, the emergence of pest resistance was really obvious and we knew what just happened, but we turned our back on that information and we just forged ahead anyway. And now here we are in 2018. There are some 30 different categories of herbicides They're called modes of action, MOAs. There are about 30 insecticide categories. We've got hundreds and hundreds of chemicals in those different categories. We have one pest, the green peach aphid, which is the smallest, squishiest, softest, least defended bug you will ever find. And it is resistant to 75 different chemicals. You can't kill that thing with chemicals. You can kill it with your thumb, but you can't kill it with a chemical. <clears throat> In 70 years, we've managed to turn our world into a world filled with super pests. And it was so easy to do. It really was. You just add chemicals and they become super pests. And then you just add a different chemical and now they're double super pests. And the, take the, l the least of them all and it turns out to be something you just can't kill. And it went from being the green peach aphid to becoming a pest on 50 different plants that we grow for commercial purposes. In the 1940s, if you counted up all the losses that farmers took from pests and from this and that and spoilage and uh, processing. It was about a third of the crop was lost. And here come the promise of technology and chemicals to help us overcome this loss that really is, farmers didn't appreciate that loss. And, but the, here comes this promise of technology. And we had just come out of this era of medicine and science solving problems. I mean, insurmountable problems it seemed like, but, but coming out of the, the medical breakthroughs of the 30s and 40s, I mean, we were talking about we could solve anything with science. And so that's the way we saw this. We didn't look at it as, oh, we should, probably shouldn't do this. No, science is providing us with an answer. Technology will solve these problems. And here we are 70 years later, Farmers are addicted to chemicals. The soil is nearly dead. We're having 
problems with water pollution, air pollution, depletion of resources, loss of biodiversity, you name it, you know, you know the story. How much of our crops are we still losing on average from the time we grow them to the time they get marketed? About one third. The promise of chemicals has fallen flat, absolutely flat. The amount of damage we've done in the meantime is impressive. Um, and it's, <clears throat> the, the Red Queen is winning. We are running from behind. We're always trying to catch up. We are never ever going to be leading this race. And so it is time for us to reconsider how we do this, how the, we do the business of growing food in our society. Just a quick anecdote. Uh, back in the days uh, when GMOs were first coming out, I interviewed some of the um, Monsanto scientists, the research scientists who developed this stuff um, in St. Louis. And I asked them, I said, okay, so everything's going to be doused in Roundup, but aren't the weeds going to, you know, evolve resistance? And they went, yeah, but we'll come up with something else. I would just add on a, on a different note. Um, this is all reflective of human society's um, pattern of trying to dominate nature, conquer nature in every respect. And it's a failed model. I mean, we find it over and over again, and we're finding it in the biggest way possible now as nature rebels against all of the pollution and toxins we've put into it. Um, you know, obviously way before climate change, but now this is the, the big one <laughs> where, where nature is, is saying, no, you know, you've put way too much of this junk into the environment and it's just not, you know, it's not going to work. And, you know, so we're, we're, we're not learning this lesson um, that on every single level, it seems that nature comes up with its form of resistance to uh, our innovations and our technologies. Um, so I'll just add that to the picture. So based on what you're saying, you're saying that um, we're spraying these chemicals on crops and they're becoming resistant, so it's getting harder to grow these crops because the bugs are getting them because the chemicals aren't working as well because they're adapting. So based on all of this, um, our GMO is a great solution that now um, we have the, we'll put, plant these GMO seeds and one, they'll use less chemicals and two, they will um, solve this problem. So are GMOs the solution to this or a solution to anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, if you, if you take a step back and say, what just happened here when we see insect resistance to pesticides, for instance, right? What just happened here? Well, we, we attempted to kill that, that organism and we weren't completely successful. And the reason we weren't completely successful is because there was a really huge population of bugs and we applied an incredibly strong toxin and it killed almost all of them, but it didn't kill a few. Well, who were those few? Well, those few probably had some mutation for tolerance or resistance to that chemical. It may have slowed them down a little, but it didn't kill them and it didn't prevent them from reproducing. Now, if there was a genetic basis to that resistance, that just got passed on to the next generation, except that we wiped out all of the competition that bug had, and we just handed them the keys to the kingdom. Here's a great big giant field that is food for you, and there's nobody else here eating it, so you and your descendants just take over. We just got insect resistance. But what did they do? It, we applied an intense stress in the form of a chemical, and that biological system overcame that stress in the matter of a few generations. If we take that chemical, let's say Bt. Bt used to be in a powdered form that was sprayed onto plants like grapevines where I grew up to kill something called the leaf skeletonizer. And the caterpillars would eat that and they'd stop eating and they'd get really sluggish and then they'd die. It was the crystal protein that was produced by the Bt bacterium. Now if we just you know, it's, it's a pain to spray that onto plants, and when it rains, it washes off. Here's what we should do. Let's take that Bt gene, and let's put it in the plant. That way, we don't have to spray the plant. It's already in the plant. Anything that eats the plant will die. And actually, we don't have to use as many pesticides and chemicals anymore because the plant's making that. Let's step back. What did we just do? We took the chemical stress 
that was being used to kill the insect and we put it inside the plant. Did we change it? No, it's still a chemical stress. What will be the response? The response will be to overcome any stress in the environment. It will kill any of the organisms out there that are susceptible to it. And the ones that don't die, those are the ones that are resistant. <clears throat> Just by moving the chemical from outside to inside doesn't change the rules of the game whatsoever. The result will always be the same, and it's always very predictable. Biotech is not a change to the rules of the game. It just moves where you put the chemical stress. That's all it does. Yeah, just a quick, uh, back to my Monsanto days. Uh, yeah, so genetic engineering was the original name uh, of all this stuff, but it's not very, it's not really engineering because it was a very random process. Sticking in that crystal of BT was a very random process in the labs. And it was a trial and error of thousands and thousands of repetitions. So the, it's the same crystal, but it's not the same plant. It's now a new type of plant. It's a GMO. What else changed within the plant? Nobody really knew back then. And there hasn't been a huge amount of study, although there's more now, uh, to say, well, how did the process of sticking this new gene uh, change the plant? Um, so we don't know everything there is to know about plants. Um, yeah, I, I would add also uh, GMOs are actually a, a disaster <laughs> uh, in terms of trying to solve this cycle because what they do is they, they actually, and, and again on a sort of adjunct <laughs> uh, basis, they, um, they maintain the system that's created the, the quote need for these pesticides and then the quote need for GMOs to begin with, which is the monoculture system the large-scale industrial system. So you have the Gates Foundation and others pushing GMOs around the world, and in some very nefarious ways, I might add. I've been researching this for some different uh, clients and groups where, you know, they, they go into universities, they develop think tanks, and they, they basically call them, you know, in pursuit of science. Uh, but they're really just pushing the GMO agenda. Like, literally, almost everything they produce is pro-GMO. And so it replicates that same system and create, you know, and again, it's, it doesn't solve anything. And meanwhile, tons of pesticides are being used. That's the other myth that the GMO, GMO industry has put out is that we're going to use this to reduce pesticides. And the reality is that uh, glyphosate, for instance, uh, is used in vast quantities uh, in, in, um, while using GMOs on GMO fields. So it's like this is not a solution in any respect, and yet what, you know, what makes it even worse is that it poses as a solution while replicating sort of the traditions of the Green Revolution going back to the 1970s, which was that industrial agriculture production was the answer to uh, what they then called third world hunger and poverty. Um, so. so just to repeat this question again, just so in terms of right now, there's a lot of people saying GMOs are good and we need them. So if, if someone gave you only one minute to answer this, to explain what you just explained, you had one minute to say it, what is the simplest one minute explanation to explain why you don't believe genetically engineered foods are a solution and why the chemical is now on the inside and you're gonna get the same result? Say it again in one minute in the simplest way if we had to explain this to people that needed a very simple explanation. Well, I would say, first of all, that GMOs are entirely unnecessary to feed the planet. We already know that there's more than enough food to feed the planet. The evidence shows this constantly over time, every time it's studied. Uh, the issues are much larger than just GMOs. Meanwhile, they do not improve the environment. They enable the same kind of manufactured industrial monoculture system that has gotten us into this mess without solving anything uh, in terms of environmental, you know, um, sustainability, and they reduce biodiversity. So, you know, there, there, there's nothing in it that we either need or, or should want. Yeah, so from a, <coughs> a greater public good point of view, there's no benefit, and there is some risk. So why do we need to take this risk so that a few companies can profit? Essentially, that's the decision that was made by the regulators uh, 
in the US, Canada, and, and a number of other countries. They'll fail every time. They will fail. And they'll be very expensive while they do it. And, and genetic biodiversity, genetic diversity is, is reduced to one. We go from having all the diversity necessary for our plants and animals to survive, we reduce it to one. Every plant in the field is a clone, essentially, of every other. There's one plant out there, just one. If anything bad were to happen, if there was a fungus, a bacteria, a disease of any kind, the entire crop is lost, entire crop. That is the most inflexible, fragile, it's, it's a, our crops are made of glass when they're like that. We are setting ourselves up for failure with biotech. We're not improving the situation. We're making it far, far worse. We're, we're creating a situation where failure is almost imminent by doing that to genetic diversity within our crop species. What's, what's the time frame you see before it becomes obvious that that's what happened? Is this, are we a year or two away? Are we a decade away? How long do you think before this adaptation to the GE crops? How long? How long? It's already happening. I mean, it's not tomorrow, it was yesterday. It was years ago. We, we started this process in the 1950s. Um, in 1951, um, a man named Harold Painter at Kansas State wrote a book called Insect Resistance in Crop Plants. It's a fascinating little book because it was at the very beginning of the DDT revolution. And he said that the plants themselves can resist the crops. We need to focus on the ability of the crop plants to resist pests. The genetic diversity within the crops enables them to do this. And <clears throat> I think the, it's an old little book, very hard to find, but it's fascinating reading because in 1951 he was saying this. He was looking at, and he was referring to pesticides at the time too. He was well aware of what they were doing. We turned in about a 180 degree direction and ran as fast as we could the other direction. We started the process of killing agriculture about then, of putting us on this pathway that we are now starting to realize is really coming back to haunt us. The process began years ago. It's not that suddenly things are going to crash, it's that pieces of the puzzle are being lost. We're, they're falling away and we're left with less and less to work with. And the biotech example is a good example of one where if we go that direction, we're just completely uh, jumping into that pond. We are throwing away um, pieces of the puzzle in order to get there. We're doing it intentionally. So um, I can't, there's no answer to that question when it's going to happen. It uh, is, is happening now. And we need to recognize that and we need to stop doing it. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. I mean, it's true. We've been losing seed diversity and plant diversity for decades. So this isn't a new phenomenon yet. It's a new iteration of a long-standing trend of winnowing out, you know, humans actually on an industrial basis winnowing out the wonderful natural diversity that our food system provides us. And so in a whole range of ways from super weeds to pest resistance and super bugs to um, a radically diminished diversity of seeds and seed varieties and therefore crop varieties. Um, we're already seeing the ramifications of that. And we should keep in mind that, you know, losing crop varieties also means it's, it's an ecosystem issue as well as just a new, you know, a, a dietary issue, you know, or a food enjoyment issue. It's like we're losing the different mechanisms that those other crops and varieties provide in terms of dealing with pests and nutri you know, nutrifying the soil. So, um, yeah, so those are huge ecosystem and biodiversity issues as well. So going forward <clears throat> in the next 20 years, um, a lot of people talk about a lot of things, but where I live, running out of food to most people doesn't seem, you know, Whole Foods market has got, the supermarkets are flooded with every variety of everything. So. What is your, I mean, what's, so how, if we're saying we got all these problems that are going to affect us in 50, 75 years, a lot of people are going to shrug. 
how imminent is it that all these different things will actually reach us and affect us? Because as long as, you know, if someone has a bad crop, we get from somewhere else. So to most people, they're saying, yeah, so you don't grow corn there, you'll get it from somewhere else. They don't really see food um, for any country as being an issue. Um, so what, what do you see as the most, I don't know, imminent problems, and when are we likely to start noticing them or ha have it affect us? Or is this something that's really a far in the future issue in terms of us affecting us here in Long Island? Um, I'll take a global take on this. So what happens is America's a rich country. You will be able to buy food in 20 years. The quality might not be as good. It'll certainly be more expensive. But the real impact is a lot of other people in the rest of the world are going to go hungry because we can afford to buy it. It's going to come here. They can't afford to buy it. They're going to go hungry and they're going to move because you know, there's no future in staying on a land where you can't grow enough food to feed yourself and your family. So you're going to move. So that's the sort of bigger picture. Yeah, I would, uh, I would add to that. Um, you know, if, if people are not uh, motivated by other people's <coughs> suffering and deprivation, um, they can think about the connections between that suffering and deprivation and their own lives in terms of, uh, well, for one thing, costs. Um, the costs of the global and U.S. food system of uh, hunger and malnutrition and malnourishment and, again, you know, so many people who don't have access to good health care, you know, the public ends up bearing a good portion of that cost in the end, not the real suffering, but the cost afterwards financially. I'd say the other biggest thing is climate change. Uh, it's not the other biggest thing, it's the biggest thing, is that continuing this same food system that we have and even having, you know, at a far slower speed, but having, um, you know, vast monocultures of organics is, is not really the solution to climate change. It's certainly better than vast monocultures of uh, pesticide-produced foods. But if nothing else, if people think well, climate change is here, it's real, it's already happening, it's devastating um, people around the world, it's also devastating industries. More and more industries are incorporating uh, climate change into their risk portfolio. They're reporting billions of dollars, trying to report billions of dollars of losses each year uh, from climate uh, disasters. And so these are things that they're actually reporting to their shareholders. Um, so we should take notice of that as well, you know, so these are, factors that cost on all sorts of levels, societal levels, human levels, and business levels even. And, and those are costs we're all going to be bearing, and it's going to happen, it is happening and will continue happening more rapidly and intensely to the extent that we do not uh, overhaul the single biggest factor to climate change, which is food production, namely industrial food production and livestock and deforestation, those factors. Um, so if we don't overhaul that, then we're just going to get there that much faster. I think it's important for us to be aware <clears throat> of where our food comes from, and then perhaps we can make choices that will help affect that change. There's no question that big corporations respond to consumer choices. Um, <clears throat> They're providing us options in our food and we're accepting those options, but if we choose to accept other options or not accept what they're offering, they will listen. Um, I don't know how long ago it was, but in January, if I tried to buy grapes at my supermarket, I would have been told, well, grapes are out of season. You can't have grapes in January and February. I can now because they come from Peru, Chile, and South Africa, and they're in the supermarket right now. But that means, <clears throat> as Lester Brown and Bob Glennon have pointed out, and World Watch Institute and, and Bob Glennon writes on water issues, um, that we're using somebody else's water. <clears throat> um, we're using someone else's soil. We're using someone else's farmland. And only because we want grapes in wintertime, and we don't need grapes in the wintertime. Uh, we need to be aware of what, what it is to be uh, um, a reasonable and realistic consumer and, and, and 
And also think about whether or not eating grapes in the wintertime is really even a good choice. Um, we need to use um, that awareness to help bring about change. Um, because I don't think, unfortunately, complaining at the, to the corporate stakeholders is really the, the, the going to get anything done. When, when Congress could not pass a law, th tried three times if I recall, pass a law to stop using chemicals in the poultry industry to produce chickens, it was only a couple weeks after that when McDonald's decided that they were no longer going to purchase chicken that was made in that way, antibiotics and, and growth hormones. McDonald's can make that decision, but Congress couldn't make that decision. And overnight, overnight, the poultry industry cleaned up its act, overnight. But McDonald's didn't do that because they love chickens. They did that because People were telling them they didn't want to eat that chicken. They wanted to eat clean chicken. So it really is, I think, incumbent on us to, to help people understand what it means to be uh, a responsible consumer of food and to help draw that attention to the people who produce the food. And when I say people, I mean corporations, but um, because I think that's the way we're going to get things changed. Um, we've been speaking about how pests are adapting to chemicals and how this is a, a problem. Um, Stephen, you wrote a whole book on water. Um, again, a lot of us hear things about water and we hear California has some droughts, but you know, it still seems like there's showers are free and it seems like there's plenty of water. Um, is this a problem that we're going to start having in 100 years, 50 years, 25 years, 10 years? Like, you know, we have a lot of things on our mind. Do we really need to think about water, or is this like point number 40 on the list? How serious is this, and you know, how do you see, where do you see us starting to notice this? Well, I think uh, folks in California are already noticing it, and folks in Texas were already noticing it, and folks in, I don't know, Nebraska, a lot of other places in the Southwest. Uh, it's a problem that's uh, global. Two out of five people around the world currently suffer from severe water scarcity. And that number is going to go up to three and five. So that's a big problem. The World Economic Forum, the guys who meet in Davos all the time, they've always got water scarcity as their, you know, one of their top risks. One of the big reasons why we're having water scarcity problems is we need water for everything. We manufacture and make all sorts of stuff, and all of that takes water. Thousands and thousands of gallons to make a big screen TV for example. And we don't manage our water resources very well. We pollute them. We waste it. There's fields and fields of acres, uh, millions of acres of irrigation in deserts where most of the water evaporates and doesn't end up on the crop. That's a common practice in the US and other parts of the world. Uh, so we don't va value water. That just creates scarcity. The other big factor now is climate change. Climate change is changing the rainfall patterns around the world. Places that were sort of dry are now very, very dry. That's the future for much of the uh, western US. And other places are getting too much water. So given those factors, we have to change the way in which we manage and use our water, or this problem is going to spin out of control. Uh, for most of us around the world. Just to clarify, we opened this conversation and you said that a cow or meat, a cow uses a lot of water to make it. If we don't eat cows, if we say I won't eat any beef, I'm strictly going to have eggs, milk, chicken, and some pork. Is that much better for water? Well, beef is definitely the biggest uh, consumer of water, so. Uh, if you have to eat meat, then yes, you can eat chicken. Chicken is a lot lower uh, in terms of its water use, but nowhere near uh, what a vegetarian diet would be. As I said before, 10 times as much water for a meat calorie than for a, a calorie from vegetables. How about fish? Fish, if you're talking about ocean fish, seawater, then of course they're not using any water at all. Aquaculture, you know, aquaculture recirculates a lot of water. So 
truthfully, I'm not sure how big the water footprint is for a farmed fish, say a tilapia, from a freshwater system. Can I just add something real quick? I mean, I, I think that's uh, all very true, and certainly in the water reduction uh, triage, we want to reduce or eliminate meat consumption. Uh, you know, but let, let's also remember that vegetable and you know that produce takes a ton of water too. The question is often where it's grown and how it's grown. And so, the industrial monoculture system. You know, when we talk about how soils are dying. That also means that they can't give themselves enough life. They need more watering as well as more fertilizing. So there's more water waste and water use in agriculture than than we would need if we used a system that was more based on agroecology and diversification and smaller scale and organic um, methods, you know, and, and then also the shipment of, you know, um, all these things just takes more water as well, so. So uh, to sum some of these things up, what are the hidden costs to society not discussed when the claim is made that food in America is cheap? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, how long do we know? So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not cheap in just about every sense we can think of. You know, when we think about the water bill that we've been talking about, if we think about um, the environmental harm and pollution that goes into the air and the water and the soil uh, and all the ways that we have to clean that up, uh, if we think about factory farming and the, and the intense water and air pollution created by that, uh, the labor abuse that I talked about earlier today uh, is, is also phenomenally uh, high and, and is, is system-wide in our food system and creates huge costs in terms of workers who are either disabled or can't work as much or need various forms of public assistance that we all give them, food stamps to um, health care, for instance. So um, those are just a few, I'm sure. And, and the long distance transit of food as well. I mean, all these things have immense uh, costs to all of us. Um, climate impacts, obviously, agriculture being one of the biggest uh, uh, causes of climate change. But I think one of the other sort of, let's say, not obvious factor is our attitude towards food. We think of food as fuel. You know, just get something to stick in our stomachs. You know, so we've lost our appreciation for the sacred act of growing something and being able to consume it, and you're becoming part of that plant and the soil and the air and the water. You know, that 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 sacred cycle, uh, understanding of the feeling that it uh, evokes, uh, is gone in most people, uh, and that's a sad loss. We, we, uh, we have demanded cheap food in this country, so we're all to blame, too, um, for the cheap food. We want cheap food. We don't like to see prices go up. And the, the government has worked assiduously to keep prices down. There are, there are uh, caps on a number of different commodities. They, they have price supports for other commodities. Um, they have subsidies for a very large number of crops. Um, and, and some of those are well-intentioned well and well-placed. Uh, there's d disaster assistance to farmers. If they lose their crop because of a disaster, they can get farm insurance and be covered. But what we really want is, is to keep a, a control on, on the cost of food. And to do that, we have approved um, a large number of governmental programs that force food to be grown in a certain way, and in so doing, keeps the price down. But it forces agriculture to go in a particular direction in order to do that. The other thing is that in order to keep prices down, the producers of food, particularly of processed food, will buy cheaper and cheaper and cheaper um, ingredients. Um, and so what used to be we might consider a very healthy food choice may not be such a healthy food choice now because of this insistence on keeping food prices down. Again, um, we don't see a lot of this, but it's, it's, um, it's right there in front of us. And so as long as we, we don't have an open discussion about that, 
um, it's probably going to get worse because we like cheap food, but by, by wanting cheap food and insisting on it, we are, we are causing inertia in changing the system and we're increasing momentum in the direction it's going. Um, and we have to come to grips with that. Food, good food, quality food, it's not cheap. Uh, in this country, and I don't know if you two know the numbers, but uh, the, the, the proportion of our income that is spent on food, you know the numbers on that? In most countries, it's considerable. In this country, it's almost nothing. Yeah, I think it's I think between U.S. and Canada, we're competing for who's the least amount uh, of money is spent on, of our income on food. It's, it's really peanuts, and it's actually much less than it was 100 years ago. Right, yeah, Europe spends far more than we do on, on their food. Um, the one other thing, oops, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I just think that I, um, you know what, I lost my train of thought. I'm going to pass it back to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Happens, right? Given the growing number of herbicide and insecticide resistant species that farmers must contend with, one could reasonably ask why do farmers continue to use chemicals? Well, I think our food and farm economy forces uh, farmers to use chemicals. I mean, there's tons of cases of farmers who want to get out of the chemical trap um, that they're in, and they'll tell people that. And the signals are not there. I mean, the, you know, sure, organics, uh, you know, may pay better, but where are they going to sell the organics? Are there local markets? Are there good distribution chains? If Walmart is now the biggest uh, uh, not producer, but seller of organics, that's not a good sign for organic farmers either to have a good uh, market to sell to. So the markets for organics, even though the market as a whole is booming, the actual individual markets for, for organic farmers are not, not huge and the incentives um, are not there to the extent that they need to be. We, meanwhile, um, you know, the, far, the, the larger policy mechanisms, the whole farm and food economy are sending the message to continue what we've been doing, uh, which includes, includes relying on petrochemicals for uh, food production. So, uh, as I spoke about earlier, the food corporations, whether it's uh, McDonald's or Coca-Cola actually demanding so much corn for their sodas or any other fast food operation or supermarket chain, they demand this, this um, you know, just like this crop, that crop, the other crop. They only want specific things that they've demanded, and they control the food's production system. They control the supply chains of how it's grown and what the farmers are going to get. And they're sending, you know, other than there are good cases like the antibiotics case, where at least there's some improvement and some progress, but the larger message in terms of chemical-based agriculture is just not there, um, you know. So we might move to antibiotic-free chicken in, at McDonald's, but it's still um, mass-produced, labor-exploiting, uh, using uh, grain feed that was, you know, grown with pesticides. Um, so the larger system is completely fundamentally reliant on that and furthering that. I think it's important to, to remember that <clears throat> there's a difference between being a commodity farmer and being a food producer. Um, there are about two million, just over two million farmers in the country. Uh, most of them have faces, but a lot of them don't. Um, about 5% of the farming industry is corporate farming. And they don't really have faces. Real farmers, that is people farming, the, the, that group, that, that gigantic group of almost two million, that make up only 23% of our food, by the way, they don't want to destroy the soil. They don't want to use chemicals. It's costing them huge amounts of money. Um, they can, they, most of them do not make enough money from farming to support their family. Very few farmers do. The farmers that do have gone commercial. They had to if they were going to make enough money to actually stay in the business. The really big farming interests are the ones who are using the disproportionate amount of chemicals. Um, and they're growing commodity crops. They're growing vast acreages of monoculture corn and soy and wheat and cotton and canola and a few others. So we do have to distinguish between who these, who these entities are. Are they people or are they 
people as defined by the Supreme Court. Um, <coughs> Uh, because there is a big, big difference, and, and the difference in how they run their lives and how they want to run their lives are very different as well. Um, the traditional farmer would very much like to get out of the chemical business, very much so. The, the farmer that has a, a, a board of directors and stakeholders is not interested in that particular aspect of farming. So what, what happens if the farmer want, the, good, the small farmer wants to get out of chemicals and just go organic, it just, why doesn't that work? Like, why doesn't he do it? I, it has a lot to do with the supply chain, uh, as Chris alluded, but. Um, yeah, I've interviewed uh, quite a few farmers who've made the switch and some that wanted to make the switch but couldn't do it. Um, there's a lot of uh, things they have to do differently. If you're gonna get off the chemical trap, you have to sort of detoxify your soil to begin with, because the soil is usually so depleted there's hardly any microorganisms left alive. Uh, and so you need those t in order to produce uh, organically. Uh, a lot of farmers have uh, debt. You know, they still old the chemical bill from last year. It takes three to five years minimum to get from that chemical form of farming to an organic form. They're not going to make the same amount of money in those years. Can they survive financially? Do they have the support in terms of what if this problem comes up? Uh, that's, you know, normally they would sort it out with a chemical, but now they can't or don't want to. So they have to have a whole set of uh, resources and training to be able to make the transition. Um, there's, you know, the odds are really stacked against it, and, and uh, it, uh, it, farmers do it. It's not easy, uh, but only those who can really, you know, marshal the support and have the commitment to make it work uh, succeed. Yeah, one other quick thing I would add is that uh, there's, there's no subsidy for organics. <laughs> there's no support system uh, for them or, or for life raft or, you know, rescue operation for them if, if things go wrong. And, you know, so part of the answer is in terms of policy, not just federal, but even on local and state levels, is to develop uh, subsidy support systems for organics. The other thing is, you know, most people doing that transition are going to be on the small or medium scale farmers, not the giant ones doing, because, you know, they have more of a need to. The giant ones might be doing okay. Um, so I think that that's where we need to put some of those support mechanisms to allow those transitions. And there are some programs that are starting to do that. Okay, I'm going to continue asking questions, but if anyone from the audience wants to ask a question, uh, raise your hands, and in between my questions, I'll call on you so we can bring you a microphone. Um, can you explain... Uh, specifically, there's the claim that raising livestock has a bigger effect on climate change than the transportation industry. Um, a lot of people, when they hear that, they get confused and don't, don't understand that. Could you explain why raising livestock would affect climate change? So if you're raising cows and pigs and chickens, how does this have anything to do with climate change? Well, for one thing, they, they emit gases. <laughs> um, methane, hydrogen sulfide, um, to name a couple, and, and these are climate harming um, gases. And it may sound minuscule on a, you know individual cow level, but we're talking about a national and global system where we're talking about millions and millions of cows and pigs and chickens, tens of billions, um, billions in fact. Um, so I'm certain sound like Carl Sagan here, but, uh, <laughs> but it's true. I mean, there's billions of these animals being harvested and produced in these viciously inhumane ways and consolidated uh, parts of the earth. We're seeing ozone depletion happening, and so much of this is because of the gases they produce and the waste that they produce that is, again, in these super concentrated um, lagoons, for instance, that are extremely toxic. Um, so that's, that's a huge part of the reason. The other pe another key piece is that they are a key factor in uh, global deforestation. So the spread of uh, livestock, industrial livestock operations in, say, Brazil and other places involves deforestation of the land, both for the livestock and for the grain feed for livestock. Cows aren't supposed to eat corn, as you probably know. They're supposed to eat grass, 
they eat grass. The rumen of a cow, the first chamber of the stomach, is about 25 gallons in size. It's a big, big place. It's a gigantic fermentation vat. And yes, it does generate some gases. Um, most of it's water and plants, and they, you know, they cough it up and they chew it again. They chew their cud, and they make it smaller and smaller until it goes, passes through into the next chamber of the stomach. That's not what cows eat in feedlots. Um, they, they eat a little bit of grass the first few months of their lives, but they spend the last three months of their lives eating 30 pounds of corn a day, or corn products, corn derivatives, a number of different things. <clears throat> and the thing about a cow's stomach is that it's a giant vat of bacteria. The cows don't actually eat grass, and they don't even get anything from the grass. The grass goes in there and feeds bacteria, the bacteria break down the cells, they take the nitrogen out, that's for the bacteria, and then they slowly sort of work on the grass and break it down a little bit as well. And the cow poops most of it out, uh, the grass part, because it's not really digestible. But when you feed a cow, you're feeding the bacteria. Now if you go over to a feedlot, they're being fed 30 pounds of corn a day. No, the cow's not getting that corn, the bacteria are getting that corn, you're feeding and by the way, an entirely different assemblage of bacteria because that's different bacteria now that eat corn. And that's all starch. And starch is very digestible, breaks down very quickly, <clears throat> and breaks down quite often incompletely. And one of the incomplete products of digestive uh, metabolism is methane. CO2 is the other. Of course, that's complete digestion. Methane is an incomplete form of digestion. And they produce vast quantities, vast quantities of methane and carbon dioxide from the food we give the bacteria. The cow is just where the food is. The cow's not doing that. But the cow has to unload that gas. It's either belching it or it's coming out the other end, but it's got to come out or the cow will literally explode. It is, um, <clears throat> they have a foaming problem too that prevents them from doing that. That'll kill a cow pretty quickly. But the problem with feedlots in our modern agriculture is we're feeding them the ingredients for climate change. They wouldn't produce those kinds of gases in those quantities if they were being fed grass. So it's not just cows, it's how we grow cows that does it. Just a quick point about methane. So methane is a super greenhouse gas, um, 30 times more potent than CO2. Um, in fact, the new science says it's really like 105 times more potent than CO2. Um, so that's the reason, the other big reason why um, an animal agriculture has a big impact on the climate. Going back to, uh, to the question of what is the immediate experience of the pesticides and insecticides, how it affects us. One of the things is that the insecticides and pesticides are full of nerve attacking uh, results, which is what kills the pesticides, the pests, and the insects. Well, well, now we're eating it. We eat the food that is in the pesticides and insecticides, and guess what's cropping up all over? So much more multiple sclerosis, so much more Parkinson's. You can go down the line of how many I illnesses we are today experiencing that affect our nervous systems. Hello. So that, that's one of the things. Um, and I wanted to ask, what are some of the um, uh, rescue missions for the, 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 the small farmer? You mentioned that there are several out there. What are, where are they? What, how do they disseminate their, their help? I'm sorry, rescue missions? I yeah, might, I think you said I might have used that term a little too loosely. Um, well, I mean, in terms of supports, right? So, pub in, uh, policy supports. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, where where can they go? Where can the small farmer go? What's available yeah. to help him or her to? I mean, there's on a federal level, there's not much. I mean, the the subsidy system doesn't provide much of anything. The average um, small farmer gets uh, a pittance, if anything, uh, in terms of any form of subsidy support. Um, Large scale, it almost all goes to large scale agriculture. Um, so, you know, they can look for, uh, you know, a good loan, I suppose. They can fall into debt, which happens all the time. Um, you know, occasionally some of the uh, 
USDA extensions might be helpful. There are programs that, you know, in some states there are nonprofits that uh, have been working with USDA to try to improve the system to have uh, young farmers and ranchers get back into business or get into business on a small scale. So that, that is happening. Like in Nebraska, there's the Center for Rural Affairs that does some excellent work around uh, that. And there, is, there are some small federal programs um, that do help with that. They're just small. So when, when I've driven down Route 303 going south, I see so many s people who would have the land to farm, but they don't have the money, and there's only one place to get food. It might be a pharmacy. It might be a, a Rite Aid, or a, uh, oh, if, they're, if it's already a bigger community, a Walmart. But, but if, if, a leg if new legal, if new laws were to be passed, or requested even, started, for local, really local f aid in that way, that could relieve some of the unemployment and at least allow people to not be hungry. And nobody seems to be thinking of that or doing anything with it. Well, there is uh, community-supported agriculture, so you and your friends could get together, find a farmer who has a piece of land, or somebody who wants to farm, Yes, but I'm yep. saying with our, our tax money. Ah, but that's, a, that's more difficult, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> um, how can, I, can I add one quick sure. thing? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I did speak about this earlier, but I do think it's really important. I mean, we can't just look at the federal subsidy system. It's so hard to change that. We need to try. But on state and local levels, we can develop food policies that can incentivize uh, small farmers to get back into business. We can have zoning encouragements for those plots of land to be used for agriculture for local markets. So there are ways to actually try to do that on a local and, and state level as well to build that up. Um, how does today's farming compare to farming in the past in terms of the damage it does to the soil? And why does that matter? Probably, the, I would say the number one thing that farming, the number one um, insult to soil in farming is plowing, turning the soil upside down. Um, soil typically doesn't move much. It doesn't, it doesn't turn upside down. When we take dark places and make them light and cold places and make them warm and we expose things that aren't exposed to heating and drying and temperature fluctuations, um, we kill them. Soil structure is, is really a part of the, the activity of fungi and bacteria and the oligosaccharides that they create that tie all the different parts of the soil together. But if you look at a really good, healthy soil, about half of it is just air or water, if there's water in it, and about a quarter of it is living, and only about a quarter of it is um, dirt, right? Inorganic dirt, sand, silt, and clay. Typical farming soil now is about 100% dirt. There's no pore space. Water doesn't percolate through it very well, and there's almost no living um, organisms in it. The only organisms that are in there are those organisms that can tolerate the kind of stresses that a farmer is typically um, applying to the soil on a day-to-day -day basis. So impact number one is plowing, turning soil upside down. It is not meant to be turned upside down. Everything in it, the entire ecosystem down there, is disrupted by that. If we add on top of that, the insults of chemicals. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit like icing on the cake, because we've already done a lot of damage already, but <clears throat> um, fertilizers are created as salts, and so those are generally toxic to microorganisms. They also change the pH of the soil, which has a negative effect on many microorganisms. And then pesticides are just pesticides. Um, they can be, uh, they can change pH, they can have uh, functions, uh, they can be bioactive in the soil. Sometimes they just break down. Um, it depends on the chemical. Um, I would say the least of the concerns in my mind is pesticides, and number one and two are going to be plowing and, and fertilizers. Um, yeah, it, our, our system of agriculture 
works really well if you're a small farmer and you farm a small patch of land and then when it gets a little bit distressed move over to a different patch of land and use that patch of land and let the weeds grow back and the plants grow back and, and that soil has a chance to rejuvenate. What's happening when it rejuvenates is plants are growing on it but they're not being taken off of it and it's not being plowed, right? It's not that we're giving it a rest, it's that we're allowing it to be soil again and to reestablish the community while we're disturbing this one over here. That's what's really going on. When we work on very large scales, the soil never gets that opportunity. So instead, we very quickly get to the point where we have to start adding things to the soil. If it's going to behave like soil for us, we have to add those, those different things in, particularly uh, fertilizers and nutrients. Uh, earlier in the, in the seminar uh, pertaining to that uh, most of the corn and soy over 50% goes to biofuels um, and so I was doing some numbers today um, in last year's calculations of corn soy it would come out to anywhere between 425 gallons to 437 gallons of uh, biofuels being created per acre um, I think we're missing the big elephant in the room um, and that is industrial hemp. Um, hemp has 300 gallons of biofuel per acre, but it is at 20% the energy units needed, in other words, to grow uh, and produce. Um, there's this whole cannabis movement going on, but nobody is speaking about hemp as being the remedy for a lot of the problems we're having today. Um, there seems to be a movement for the smokers out there, but there's nothing for the industrial side. Not only do you get the, 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 the seed uh, and everything else, but you also get the rest of the plant and the other 50,000 uses that could be used from that into different industries. So there is a way that these farmers can go ahead and do this, these small scale farmers, but it needs to take us to go ahead and make that change. Your opinions. I don't think you're wrong about that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, uh, Lyndon Johnson wanted to do a synthetic fuels program way back when, and it was pointed out to him, and I don't know if he's the one who came to the conclusion, but somebody did in his administration, that it takes more fuel to make synthetic fuel than you get from making synthetic fuel, right? So it's a net loss. If you take a look at, at the amount of energy we get in biofuel out of corn, it's a net loss. We put more energy into it, processing it, growing it, than we get out of it. Um, it's not a very effective way to use our resources. And so there are crops out there that would be much better choices than corn and probably less damaging to the environment. Yeah, I, I would only add that, you know, I mean, in a way, biofuels, ethanol, and others can be seen as an excuse to continue uh, using and overusing uh, two things, you know, corn and cars. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's, there's, you know, there's, you know, it's a way to just maintain the current system and not really address climate change. And it's true that actually um, the climate footprint of ethanol and other biofuels is negative, not positive. If you factor in uh, processing, the growing of the corn to begin with, uh, or soy, and then um, the shipping of it as well and the processing of it. So, um, you know, I guess also in terms of hemp, I don't, I, you know, I don't know very much about it, but it's obviously a wonder plant in so many different ways. That it's so super versatile. And, you know, I think that we need to start to move toward farming and agriculture that um, replenishes natural systems and, and really uses the things we need, not just the things that the market or these, you know, the corporate profiteers at the top are demanding. So that would be part of moving back in that direction of re-diversifying our food and bringing hemp back and bringing other crops back into our systems. So we, we discussed, we've discussed um, some significant problems with today's food system and the growing of food and all the issues around it. So assume that you guys were given full authority over the food system in the United States and Canada and you only you three had to be consulted and you can make any decisions 
um, but not a philosophy or a theory or a, a discussion, the specific action steps that you, if you were in charge, would make. What would be, you know, what are your 10 steps that you would implement mm -hmm. if you had to name them and be very specific of the policies that you think would be in the highest good of the United States and Canada and the rest of the world in terms of the food system? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I mean, I have thought about this a lot. Um, I didn't want Canada to play second fiddle, but <laughs> um, whether we call it a food bill or a farm bill, sustenance bill, um, you know, I would want to see a whole set of policies that reorient our public investments and our subsidies into uh, smaller scale, uh, organic, diversified production to have massive public investments in uh, revitalizing either, you know, it could be vacant urban lands that could be, re you know, put into production uh, to incentivize uh, non-organic industrial farmers to move into organic and diversified production. Again, as, as has been said, it can take time. It's a process. So let's incentivize, let's pay farmers to do that. And let's create the markets for it. And let's expand um, you know, those, those market signals, but let's use the mechanisms of public policy to do that. Um, you know, we clearly need to um, do this on state and local levels as well. We need to radically reduce our, our water use in agriculture, radically reduce meat consumption. Uh, and, you know, there are small steps happening that I think need to be massively expanded. They're actually promising school lunch programs that are addressing climate change on a tiny level by either eliminating or radically reducing meat consumption in lunch uh, and having mostly plant-forward, plant-based lunch programs with maybe little bits of meat or, you know, blended burgers. You know, some of these can sound like tiny little steps, but if we, if we had much uh, greater investment in these, if we magnified these programs um, nationwide, we'd, we'd see tremendous progress in reducing climate, um, our climate footprint, our water footprint, water use, and again, moving to a system that is so much better for farmers, for our, for our health. Um, the other piece of that is that we need to price in uh, proper treatment of workers, the workers that produce our food. And part of that is corporate profits. So we need to figure out a way to uh, tax the food industry and corporate profits in a way that would re repatriate that money back into the production of food instead of us subsidizing them on the back end for all the harm that those companies cause and that the industry causes to workers and the environment and farmers and everybody else and our health. Uh, we should be taxing the food industry uh, and their profits at the top uh, to bring in some of the money that's part of the reason our food, food bill is as high as it is. We're paying for corporate profits. We're not just paying for the cost of food. We're play, paying for capitalism and corporate profits. So we need to start to rein that in. My one specific <laughs> policy proposal would be to um, use a carbon tax. The money is generated from a carbon tax, which of course would, this would be applied to agriculture, and take those monies and implement the programs Andy just suggested. I, I think I have one thing also that I would suggest, and that is we have to reward people for being good to the land, <laughs> for being good land stewards. Um, um, it's very difficult for farmers to take risks. It's very difficult. And so we have to provide a safety net or at least some sort of system where it's acceptable to move into a new market, to move into a, uh, something that's slightly risky and not to say, well, you know, I'm guaranteed price supports on corn. I guess I'm going to grow corn. Um, that's the way the system is set up now with the farm bill and some of the, uh, the energy bill and things like that. We have to reward reward people who make steps in the directions we want them to go. And I don't know how you do that, necessarily, how you would implement that, but that's what I would think. Um, what is the problem with aquaculture and fish farms? In other words, taking all the raising of fish 
um, out of the oceans and or in oceans and also on land. Um, is this a, is this a good solution for food production, having aquaculture both on and off the land? I can speak a little bit. Uh, I've covered this a bit. Um, so it's become a major source of. Uh, fish protein around the world, uh, aquaculture. Um, in most places, it's done badly. It's had all sorts of uh, impacts on the ocean. It's ended up, uh, there's shrimp aquaculture that ended up clear and cutting uh, mangrove uh, coastal areas, which caused all sorts of problems. These fish farms, because they're so intensive, you have to move every few years because of disease uh, problems with the fish. Also with the pollution of the, 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 uh, the bottom underneath the, the net pens where they're uh, associated. Uh, they, some of these uh, fish escape into the ocean, often the wrong species in the wrong place, and they compete with other. Um, so disease, as I say, also can spread to uh, wild species. So there's a, a lot of problems uh, with aquaculture. On land, I'm not so familiar. It's uh, generally a little bit more contained, but I'm sure there's some problems with that too. If you can always do something. If you're going to do it on an industrial scale, it's likely going to turn out wrong at some point. Stephen, do you know what kind of food they feed um, most um, aquaculture uh, anchovies, isn't it? Uh, in, in, in saltwater systems? Yeah, anchovies. In freshwater systems, I think the number one food is corn. <laughs> I, believe, I believe so. I, last I read, I think we've, we're raising about half a million tons of both tilapia and salmon in this country. They're about equal, last I read. And at least the salmon are being fed corn. I think you can feed tilapia anything. Hmm. Um, they're getting animal byproducts, too. They do very well on cat food. Um, you can feed them anything, and they are a low-quality food, low-quality fish. Um, but if you feed fish low-quality food, I think you're going to get low-quality food in return. So my, my concern with aquaculture is, is how it's being managed in that sense. I do know that uh, large numbers of tobacco farmers in Kentucky and Tennessee, aquaculture has been one of the, one of the forms of food production they have turned to. So it has, it's had some, there, there's definitely some bright sides to it, but, but um, I don't think we're feeding them the highest quality food we can get. Yeah, I'm not an expert in this area, but I, I would just add that I think this is another example of if you don't change the underlying uh, e economies, political economy behind the food system, you're not going to be able to really change that much. Um, we can have these, these nice innovations, but um, if the signals aren't there to change the system, we're going to have, you know, again, industrial production of anything uh, in any direction that we go in. So we have to address that at the same time. So if you were just uh, making a simple comparison and saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compare a farmer in 1944 versus a farmer in 2018. Um, what, what is the difference in the impact the 1944 farmer, farmer was having on the land and the environment versus today's farmers? Yeah, I think we touched on that a bit earlier, but um, the 1944 farmer did not have a huge amount of technology at his or her disposal. Um, their ability to have an impact was much, much smaller than it is today. Um, farming then was done on generally a smaller scale. There were large farms, but it was generally a smaller scale. Many, many more people were farmers then than there are now. That was, what, three generations ago now. Um, we had not really become, begun, we were in the midst of it, and hadn't really begun the gigantic movement of Americans from rural areas into cities, particularly into suburbs and then into exurbs that has happened in the last couple of decades. So that world was a world that, well, my friends all grew up in that world when, in, when I grew up in California. Um, 
the, and I know that my friends in the last couple of decades have sold their farms to corporations and then they went to work for the corporation. And part of that problem was that they can't afford the machinery, among other things. They can't afford to drill a new well. A new well in my area in California, and this was when I was there, and it, so it's been a while, was $50,000. You had to put, have a $50,000 bond with the bank before they would lend you the money for that. Um, and, and the water level was dropping rapidly, and that was then. I don't even know where it is now. Um, so the world then was really, really different. There, we didn't have the tools that we have now that, that <laughs> we can bring to bear on in agriculture. So this is just now is a, a different world. Our ability to, uh, I don't know if you've seen some new farms being produced, an area that hasn't been farmed before. I, I've seen it in California a lot because they converted uh, most of the coastal foothills into vineyards in the last couple of decades um, because of the market for wine bad wine mostly. Um, <clears throat> but when they decide to make a farm now, they take out a laser leveler um, because California agriculture was always uh, what we call flood irrigation. You put water on one end of the field and there's a slight tilt to the field and it all runs to the other end and then you collect it at the other end because now it's got salt in it and you run that water off somewhere else like a wildlife refuge where nobody will care about it. And, but you don't leave it there on the land. So the, you can't just farm any piece of land that way. You have to get out there and, and completely change it. You have to level it, flatten it, and make it amenable these days to big, big machines. Um, we used to have uh, gangs of pickers in California. They were all Mexican migrant workers. Now I don't, now they have machines that do all the picking. Grapes are picked by machine now. There's a, I just saw a video the other day of a tomato picker, and in the tomato pickers, and I don't mean, I mean the little Roma tomatoes that are made into soup and tomato sauce, the machine picks up two rows, and, and it comes across a conveyor belt, and there used to be six women up there, and they would pick out the good tomatoes and toss them in a conveyor belt, and off they went in the back of a truck. <clears throat> now, there's a little laser thing that sees all the green tomatoes, and a little flipper knocks them right out of there, and, and it just takes all that stuff out, and then it goes, there are no women on that machine anymore. So that's a different world. Farming is just a different world now. Um, the tools and the technology and the chemicals and everything, it's, it's just a different world. Um, it's not a world that you can just get into. It's too expensive. Either you were born into it and, you're, and you've managed to to figure out how to do it, um, or you don't, because I don't think you get into that very easily. It takes a lot of money. Um, so I, I, I don't know if that answers the question, but it's a different world is what it is. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add a little bit to that. I mean, I think that, you know, we don't want to romanticize what farming in the 1940s might have been like or, or was. It was hard, hard work, but, uh, you know, it's always been hard work, but there's some tremendous differences in terms of um, many things he's just mentioned, you know, the pesticide load was hardly anything at all. Pesticides were just starting to be um, sort of pushed onto the system more, but it was, very, you know, more and more, most farms were still operating in a mostly organic fashion. Um, land was much more accessible to purchase, of course, much cheaper. Uh, it wasn't in as much competition with development for uh, accessing land. We have to remember that, like, you know, real estate development and expansion increases the cost of farmland as well. So, and then if a farmer can't, can't afford it, somebody else will buy it and develop it. So, you know, those factors go in. Also, uh, the subsidy system was, was barely just starting in its first iterations. It started in the 1930s as a, an emergency sort of crop support system, and that was just still coming online. Um, there was more of an opportunity for farmers to diversify. In fact, most farmers had diversified production, so their soil was much healthier, not only because it hadn't been exhausted by uh, chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides for all these decades, um, you know, not to mention tractors, <laughs> um, but, and plowing, but, but also just that, you know, they were rotating their crops and they had diversified production. If they had animals on their farm, they were often part of that cycle of life. Um, they were feeding their own um, some of their own food to their, farm, to their animals and 
then the animals would feed the land. So there was much more of a natural system cycle. And the biodiversity surrounding the farms was in much better shape, much stronger um, than it is now. And that, in turn, as people have spoken about, feeds into everything from pest control to pollinators to the rest of the ecosystem's health. So, uh, you know, some things might look better now. I would say that on the whole, <laughs> I would prefer a farm from back then. Um, yeah, it's, it's in pretty rough shape where we are now. So regarding pollinators and bees and bugs and insects, what is going on with them? And is this something that we need to even be thinking about? Is this a concern? Has anything changed with insects and pollinators in the last 50 years? And do we need to be concerned about this? Well, e even where I live up in Canada, there's been a big decline in uh, bee populations. Um, mostly due, it looks like, to the new type of insecticide, uh, neonicotinoids. How do you pronounce that? Neonicotinoids. <laughs> Yeah, those ones. Um, also known as neonics, uh, which is easier to say. Uh, so it's a class of a uh, new type of uh, called systemic. So the uh, actual toxin, much like a GMO, is actually in the plant. It's actually in the seed in this case. And the, when the seed grows, the plant contains the toxin. Um, this gets into the water, gets into the soil. It kills a lot of different insects. It's affecting earthworms. It's affecting a whole range of uh, species it's not supposed to. Um, so this has been a huge issue. It's been banned in uh, much of Europe. Uh, parts of Canada have now banned these. I'm not sure what the status is here. Yeah, I, I can just add a, let, a little to that. I mean, it, you know, the pollinator crisis is uh, of huge significance to our food system and our ecosystem. Um, they pollinate, you know, apples, they pollinate fruit trees, they pollinate uh, tons of different plants. They also replenish and pollinate just the, the surrounding ecosystem around a farm. Um, so that also uh, speaks to what is the pest environment around the farm? What is, what is the bird environment around the farm? I mean, these, all these things are connected. Um, you know, I've done a little research and work on how the petrochemical industry, has, like ba led by Bayer and some other corporations, um, has been pushing back on any pollinator reforms. And so they've been uh, really stifling attempts in the United States to ban neonics, as they're called. Um, so efforts across the country, we did a report called Buzzkill. Uh, Friends of the Earth, I work with them, did this report, looking at how across the country the industry was uh, gumming up the gears of reform in legislatures across the country by not, not always just even opposing it, but just talking about how complicated the whole thing is. And they blame, um, uh, what are they called, veromites, I think. There are these other, you know, they come up with these other excuses. I'm not saying that there's nothing there to their explanations, but they're great at producing all, this, all these um, reports talking about how complicated, you know, first they denied there was even a pollinator crisis. And then when that was undeniable, now they, their whole strategy has been to muddy the waters uh, and they've been doing it very effectively. Um, I, wondered if anybody knew, I wondered if anybody knew what percentage of, for instance, the California water problem is, is engendered by Nestle's, for instance, who is getting paid to uh, take the water out of California, put, bottle it, and sell it all over the world, and whether there are any local um, whether there's any local resistance to it? Uh, does the governor have anything to say about it? Who passes laws about it? Now, that's a, a Swiss or French company, Nestle's. And the water's going all over the world, and farmers in California need water. Where's the balance? Water in California is a, a very interesting problem um, because <coughs> There is a lot of water in California. It's just usually in the wrong place. Um, California depends on the snowpack more than any other form of water in the Sierra Nevadas. And when the snowpack is good, farmers are happy. Um, and the nice thing about the snowpack is that if you get a really good one like they did last year, it lasts for more than a year. It's, it's slow-release water. 
Um, unlike rain, rain fills reservoirs and then you can't put any more in and then when it rains again, you, it has to go. You have to let it go. But snow is better. Snow is great. Um, they got so much snow last year, they, they opened even ski lifts in, in uh, October. I think the winter was so warm, I'm not sure any is left though this year. That's how warm last year's winter was. Um, and in the summer as well. The summer was unbelievable this year. Um, Southern California and different places, Coachella Valley, Imperial Valley, they have water because they get water from the Colorado River. Uh, whereas, and, and, but unfortunately, and it's more than just the Nestle problem. Um, one of the crops they make is alfalfa and they sell the alfalfa to Japan so they can grow cows to make beef so they can eat beef. Um, and so the rest of California can say, hey, we're in a drought here and you're selling our water to Japan, but the water's in the wrong place. You can't get it up there where the almond trees are. That depends on snow melt. Um, so I, 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 you know, when someone's pumping the water and then shipping it out of the state or moving it around, things like that, I, I don't disagree that it's a problem, but I think uh, in, in comparison to climate change, it's uh, a smaller part than, than you might think. It's just they've got some big fish to fry, and they don't have a big frying pan. Desal is an interesting one. Go. Yeah. Well, um, desal works. Uh, a lot of uh, countries in the Middle East, that's what they use. It's super expensive, uses huge amounts of energy, uh, creates uh, pollution. Uh, this, the, the brine that comes from these plants after you've cleaned up the water, right? It's got to go someplace. Very often in the Middle East, they dump it into the Arabian Sea, which of course is becoming more salty, and that's bad for the ecology, and also makes it more difficult for desalination plants to work properly because they're now getting saltier and saltier water. So it can work. We need to find a better way to do it uh, that doesn't use so much energy. It's easy to do in the Middle East. They have lots of oil and gas to burn, uh, so it's a huge uh, climate change problem all by itself. Um, there's attempts to use solar power to desal and some new filtration things that are a little bit better. Also, we need to find uses for this brine. Table salt, I, I'm not sure, I think there's other things in there. I don't know if you could do table salt, but yeah, it's, um, it can work in a few places, but it's not something we can rely on to solve all of our water problems. Yeah, I, I would add, that, I mean, desalination, desalination is yet another one of these efforts to, um, to fix the wrong thing. You know, it's like we're trying to just maintain the system that we have instead of addressing the fact that um, there are ways to radically reduce our water use, you know, including the bottled water industry is a disaster. You know, it's even worse in India, actually, than in California, I'd say. But, you know, Coca-Cola's got huge bottling plants there. They use tons of water. You have place, cases around the world of huge corporations uh, privatizing all entire water systems. You know, Bechtel in Bolivia is another one. And we have cases in the United States as well with private, more and more private corporate control over water systems. You know, and I mean, I remember doing a story in California years ago on a corporation called Cades, which is a, a uh, water uh, and, and food agriculture corporation. And they uh, successfully managed to um, de decimate the aquifers and, and underwater, underground water systems in the desert uh, in order to divert water from Colorado River into the desert. So they had to develop these water diversion systems uh, in order to farm um, crops that require tons of water in the middle of the Mojave Desert. So in the middle, they're in the middle of doing this. They've been doing, working on this for years and they managed to succeed in getting their project through. And you know, this is just a classic example of somebody who had a lot of money, a lot of corporate power, had stacked water committees on county levels even, you know, things like water boards and that, that kind of thing. So this is the kind of thing that we really also need to address, you know, before we start focusing on things like desalinization is, you know, definitely uh, radically reducing meat consumption and dairy production and all of that and farming the right things in the right places in the right ways. There's tons of drought, well-proven drought tolerant crops that are, um, have been going for centuries way before GMOs were ever thought of. Um. We've been speaking for a while. You guys have written three books. You speak very well. You're very articulate. It makes sense. 
what happens? I mean, you've, you've spoken to a lot of people, you, um, you've done interviews, people have read your book, maybe you've spoken to people at government agencies. Um, there's a lot of people who are you know, kind of outraged that a lot of the things you're saying, so what's prevent, I mean, there's a lot of honest people who want good things to happen. What's happened when you've shared this information with important, influential people? Um, is everyone just ignoring it, or what's the response? It seems like other people would react like we are and say this is outrageous and we should be changing things. What's been your experience? Uh, well, I don't want to hog the mic, but I guess I'll get, uh, all right. I mean, I, you know, I, it's interesting. I, you know, I mean, I mean, I think that things, you know, I spoke earlier about this. I think things are going in two directions at once. I think that knowledge and awareness is expanding in some really tremendous ways. And I think that alternatives, I hate to call them alternatives because they're really more like what we used to do uh, in agriculture and farming are rising up uh, and programs are rising up to gain access to those, whether it's urban farming or uh, you know, farm to school programs, farm to hospital programs, all these other kinds of things that try to like connect those dots with sustainable production, people in need of good, healthy food without doing large scale industrial agriculture that pollutes the planet. So these things are happening. They're at such a small scale. I mean, I think the problem is, I'm not really a scale person, but I just think that, you know, the scale of these programs is tiny. The scale of funding for these programs is tiny. I remember covering uh, a, a movement back in the mid-90s called Community Food Security that combines so many of these terrific aspects of organic, local food production, sustainable agriculture, uh, addressing urban poverty, training people to, to learn about urban agriculture, create some jobs, you know, a win, 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 win. And they lobbied, they lobbied, they lobbied for years. They finally got a bill passed in Congress and a funding stream, and they got four and a half million dollars nationwide. <laughs> so it's like, imagine if, you know, they got 15 or 20 billion dollars instead of um, the agribusiness subsidies being in that direction. So it's like, these are, you know, that's why things are not changing um, nearly on the scale that they need to change because the underlying, not just politics, but the economy of food, the corporate control over the food system and, fun, and really just capitalism. I mean, you know, whether we're going to develop a different system or not, we need to be honest about the ramifications of a capitalist system that has grown into what it is today, you know, with some policy help. But this is the, this is the natural byproduct of a capitalist system that is dominated increasingly by oligopolistic corporations that then have the economic and the political controls. We're not going to be able to you know, they have the keys to the kingdom. It's like, we can't seem to unlock that. Um, so we have to break through that, and it might be pollinating up from the bottom on local and state levels, um, but I think that having that larger systemic approach is, is key. Uh, so in my case, it's uh, when there's a water crisis, then people turn to my book, because <laughs> there's a whole bunch of tips on how to reduce your water use. Um, and certainly people have come up to me and said, they've, never realize, and I've done this now, and I now shut off the tap when I'm brushing my teeth, I got a low flow toilet, and so on and so forth. So a lot of you know, practical things can be done to reduce water use. At the local level, again, when there's a drought, especially a prolonged one, people start to think about their water use very differently, and the communities get together and figure out ways uh, to say, okay, we're not gonna, we're gonna try and phase out lawns, because what the hell is grass good for anyways? Um, and that kind of thing. Um, th so that's the, those are the changes that I've seen since the book's been out for whatever, three years now, I guess. Um, and more and more people are talking about water issues, albeit when I was in California during the drought year, just after my book came out, there wasn't a lot of interest, I have to say. I was very shocked. Mm. Uh, and it turned out when I asked around, they said, oh, well, we had some rain in December. I was like. It's like uh, you're losing by 30 points in a basketball game and somebody on your team hits a three-point shot, you know. You didn't win. Um, so it does take time um, and unfortunately also takes uh, crises to get us to uh, change. I'm a, I, I really do. I'm a firm believer that, that if you start small and, and you, can, you can point to demonstrations that work 
you can point to groups that are doing the right thing, that you can collectively gain a lot of attention. But I also believe, and this is probably the bigger problem, is that you have to find an angel somewhere. <coughs> um, I think Elon Musk is this brilliant guy. I love him because single-handedly, Tesla is going to change transportation in this country. And even if Tesla doesn't sell everybody an electric car, every other car company is now in competition with them to try to beat them at their own game. This is fantastic. This is the best thing ever. Because no one else could do this. No other car company was interested in electric cars. And now suddenly this guy's got one and he can beat you all. Everybody loves his cars and it's faster than yours too. <coughs> and now everyone wants one, right? The other day, who was it? Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and somebody else came out and said, you know, if the government's not going to come up with a decent overall of this of, of a medication plan, prescription medication, we'll just do it ourselves. We've got two million employees between the three of us. We're going to come up with our own system. We'll test it on ourselves, and if it works, we're going public with it. <clears throat> I think when, when, you know, the Warren Buffetts and, and the Bill Gates, he catches a lot of stick in this, you know, for some of the things he's doing, but when someone with a billion dollars comes along and goes, you know, that's a good thing. Let's put our money there it suddenly changes the entire dialogue. So although I think nothing works like local programs, but if you can get somebody like that to say, oh, I see, this is going on everywhere. I didn't realize there was this much interest in it. Then I think that that's how you can turn the tide sometimes on something that's really big like this. Okay, why don't you each give us your closing thoughts and we'll, uh, any, any final thoughts that you wanna share with us and we'll close. So in the water thing, <laughs> I think we're all a little bit weary by now. Um, there's no question that water is way more important than oil because we need it for everything. I ask a question at, uh, when I do talks for kids, can you think of something that doesn't need water to make? And if you can imagine, you know, I don't know how many thousands of kids have asked this question to now. They haven't been able to come up with an answer and boy, they have tried. So we need water. We are managing our water poorly, which is good news in one sense, in the sense that we can do much, much better. We're facing water scarcity all over the world, but we can manage our water resources much better so that there's plenty of water for all of us to grow our food, to have our electricity, to have the things that we need. But we have to be smart about it, and we have to respect water in ways that we're not uh, doing currently, and we have to value water you know, we talk about cheap food. Well, water is way, way cheaper than food. And that is one of the big problems. So we need to value and price water accordingly. I would say that on a couple of levels, um, we need to return to nature as much as possible. We need to um, return our agriculture back to uh, natural, there's a whole movement of natural systems agriculture, of working with the wild. and it may not be replicable on the kind of scale that we need, but I think that moving in that direction will be uh, vital. <laughs> I think that um, moving back in harmony with biodiversity and ecosystems, you know, nature proves time and time again that it is uh, endlessly intelligent. <laughs> it may not provide us everything that we want, but it provides everything that it needs and it has provided all the ingredients that we have turned into agriculture. So, you know, if we could come up with some combination of, you know, agriculture is a, is, is a human creation, but if we can come up with a combination of the more natural systems version of agriculture and some of what we have today, um, you know, I think that we'd be heading in the right direction. I think that, you know, fundamentally, um, in terms of climate change, you know, going back to this question again, this is the fate of the planet. <laughs> this is the fate, well, it's the fate of more likely really to human species, not the planet. You know, the planet's fine. Probably be happy without us, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> but us, anyway. Um, so, you know, food being the single biggest uh, ingredient in climate change as a sector, um, I, I think that everybody needs to think long and hard about that in terms of the kinds of food system that we have today, the food economy we have today, 
Um, and understand that corporations running the show, it's not about saying that a corporation is evil. It's also what it's saying is fundamentally, here's how they operate. Some companies behave better than others. They have nicer CEOs than others. But fundamentally how they operate is they demand and command supply chains. They demand and command a set of practices that predominate our agriculture system to the, to the harm of all of us in terms of having that monoculture system that we've been talking about, the pesticide-based system, not having the kinds of messages and market signals that farmers need and many times want uh, to get out of that petrochemical crap, uh, trap, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so I think that we fundamentally have to get out of that. And the final piece of that is to value the role of the public sector in food. You know, we th the public sector does so many other things and they, and they do a lot of good. You know, there are problems with it. Uh, there are many problems with the private sector. There are problems with everything humans do. But the public sector, um, Again, you know, we do roads, uh, we do traffic lights, we do all these other things, and yet we hardly ever talk about food, uh, even on a national level, never mind a local level. Um, so food and how food is produced and making it more sustainable, more climate friendly, uh, and, all, and, and better for workers and farmers, all these things, needs to be put at the center of politics and the center of political discourse and conversations. Um, yeah, and just to see that all these issues that we're dealing with, we're subsidizing those corporations and their profits, and we have to take that money back. Those are good words. Um, I think that ultimately we have to stop lying to ourselves about how we fit in this world. Um, we are just beginning to understand just how important it is to our own health uh, to pay attention to the little guys that live inside of us. We have just scratched the surface on that. We, we're not even close. We, we know so little that it's, it's a little astonishing sometimes how little we know about how we work. And the, and the problem is that if we continue to modify the world, uh, particularly in a negative way, reducing biodiversity and reducing options, reducing our food quality, before we understand just how important it is to us. And I think we're learning that now with, with um, modern food. What, how uh, our lack of attention, or at least our willingness to accept low quality food as an alternative to what we know is traditionally good food, um, what kind of ramifications that has on public health. And, and it's not just, like I have said before, it's not, it's not just my health and your health and our health in here. It's our health as a species. It's, it's around the world now. Um, the obesity epidemic, diabetes, these, these food-related, diet-related diseases that we're suffering from that are completely unnecessary. Completely unnecessary. Um, and it comes from... I don't know, we could say it's our own ignorance, but we could also say it's our own arrogance about how we think this world works. And we, we just don't know. You know. We need to be very careful about how much more modification we do to this world before we get to a point where we may not be able to get some of it back. So I, I really think that we have to, that we have to, to learn caution and our culture in particular, not speaking for our northern friends necessarily, but uh, our culture in particular has been uh, very um, wasteful and arrogant and unwilling to, to believe this. And, um, and, and unfortunately, the entire world looks at us as a role model. And um, wow, I'm not sure they're choosing a good role model, but um, we, we really do need to, to um, use the knowledge that we have to try to better ourselves as we go further into the future. So I want to thank all of you for taking the time to come here, for spending so many years researching this to, so you could sum it up and share it with us so we could all gain confidence and a cl clarity about this. And sometimes it's hard to get information if you're just reading newspapers. So the fact that you devoted your lives, did all the research, and made it free to us um, we really appreciate that, so thank you very much.